Gracious God, we admit that there are things we sweep under the rug. Shame, self-doubt, mental health struggles, and our own insecurities. We know that is not what you want for us. For Jesus loved the healthy and the sick parts of everyone. With Jesus, there is no stigma, fear, or bias. God of creation, help us to love and live in the same way. Forgive us when we hate ourselves or distance ourselves from others, simply for being human. You long for better, and we long for you. Hear these words. The God who created the heavens and the earth hears our cries, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom, unraveled by grace shown to us so that we can do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a, a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never go thirsty or have to keep coming back here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is he now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, 
I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. That was a long one. So there's this story about Martin Luther. You might have heard of this one before, um, where Martin Luther was a young monk, and he was always in confession. All the time he was going in, and for hours he would be in confessing his sins. And then after he was finally felt like maybe he was done, he would leave, and then a short period of time again, he would be back in confession. Martin Luther confessed so much that his fellow monks and the people there that were hearing his confessions really became concerned about his mental well-being. They worried that maybe he was depressed. They worried that he was too focused on sin and couldn't really quite get past to the grace and the love aspect of God. And they discouraged him from coming to confession because it was just far too often, they thought. But for Martin Luther, if you had to confess every sin that you have committed— Well, he just kept thinking about them and those things that he knew and all those things that he wasn't necessarily aware of. And so he was really aware of the ways in which we just constantly fall short. And so it sent him into confession over and over again. Now, I don't know if this story is actually true about Martin Luther, But I think that understanding of sin that we see in this was the beginning of the theology that began to get him to start to nail the 95 theses on the church door that we celebrate today. When he did that, he did not want to start Protestantism or a Lutheran church. What he wanted to do was he wanted to reform his church, the Catholic church, But for Luther, there was no way we could confess every single sin that we have ever committed, and there was no way that we ourselves could make ourselves right with God. If we could do it all ourselves, well, we wouldn't need Jesus, would we? Because we could just do it all on our own. And so for Luther, the moment that we realize that, the moment that we realize that it's not all just on us. That is a moment of freedom that Luther says. And so today we heard the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And we heard in our sermon series, it is unraveling shame is the theme of today. Now shame, according to Brene Brown, who's pretty famous for talking about shame and vulnerability, she's an author and a social scientist, She defines shame as that feeling that we are deeply flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. I wonder if part of what kept Martin Luther going back into confession, if part of that was shame that he was feeling. And I also wonder for this woman who is at the well at noontime, we hear, I wonder if what has her there in the middle of the day might be shame and, uh, as well. Maybe it's that fear of belonging. Because going to the well to collect water was a woman's job, but they usually did it in community. And it was very hot at the noon part of the day, and gathering water is backbreaking work. So you would never do that at the very height of the day. But yet we find her there at noon. Now, historically, this Samaritan woman is kind of seen as someone who lived an immoral and sinful life. She was a harlot. Hence the reason why she had five husbands and the person that she's with now isn't her husband. 
I bet you've probably heard a sermon or two that told you that is who she was. And that could very well be true. That could be who she was. But the reality is, we don't know why she had five husbands and why the man that she was currently living with was not actually her husband. She could have been divorced. She could have been widowed five times. She could have been unable to have children. She could have been a victim. There are lots of different reasons why she could have found herself in the circumstance that she found. And so we don't know exactly why she is there at the middle of the day at that well. But I wonder if she too is struggling with shame. That feeling of feeling unworthy of love and belonging in the same way that I think all of us in some way or another struggle with that very same thing. And there at that well, at noontime, Jesus sees her. And Jesus doesn't just see her and her water jug and ask for a drink, but Jesus really sees her. Jesus sees all the parts of her. And in this dialogue that happens to be the longest conversation between Jesus and another person that's recorded in the Bible— This woman is left at the end of that conversation feeling so seen and so known and so heard that she leaves her water jug and she runs back to her family and her friends and tells him all about this man that she just encountered. And so I wonder in that conversation if Jesus sees her shame and I wonder if Jesus begins to unravel it. And so even those pieces that she tries to hide from people, those pieces that I think each of us have that we want nobody to know about us, that he sees that of her, and she slowly sees who he is, and she feels understood and heard. And then Jesus offers her this living water and tells her about living water. Water that will cause her to never be thirsty again, and water that will bubble her up to eternal life. And we don't get an exact definition of what this living water is, but I wonder if it's the opposite of shame. I wonder if what living water here is meant to be is love and belonging and grace. And that living water washes over whatever wounds she had experienced in her life, and she is able to take a deep breath and sit in that love and that grace and that joy that it is of being fully known. Now, in order to receive this water, Jesus doesn't ask her to confess. Jesus doesn't tell her that she has to say magic words or Go off and do four good deeds. And once you've done four good deeds, then you can have this living water. Jesus just offers it to her. And that's the other beautiful part about our Lutheran theology that we celebrate today on Reformation Sunday. That Luther came to understand that faith is actually a gift, like an offering of a cool drink of water on a hot day in the middle of the desert. And that gift is given to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so through that living water, our shame that we carry is unraveled too. We too receive that blessing of belonging and of grace and of love. And we too are known. Those pieces of us that we are proud of and those pieces of us that we want no one to ever know. Now, I know for me, some days are easier than others to believe this. And I wonder if that's the same for you too. But I pray that on those days when maybe we get lost in our shame, those days when maybe we feel unworthy of love and of belonging, that on those days that we encounter Jesus, right there in the sun, and that Jesus reminds us of who and whose we are. Amen.
Please stand as we pray together for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. Renew and inspire the church in the freedom of the gospel, O God. Where the church is in error, reform it. Where the church speaks your truth, strengthen it. And where it is divided, unify it. Unite us in the working of the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the earth changes, as the mountains shake, and the waters roar, may we care for this planet as a holy habitation for all living things. Sustain all peoples and lands recovering from natural disasters of any kind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, you tenderly care for all your children and nurse them to health. Bring relief to all those who need healing, hope, or restoration this day, especially those we name out loud at this time or in the silence of our hearts. We pray for. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, we remember those who were dear to us and now rest in you. We give thanks for Martin Luther and all who seek to reform and renew your church. Give us courage to live out your gospel, revealing your love until our days on earth have ended. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup of wine, he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, you are invited to partake in communion, knowing that this is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Please stand as you are able. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Mother in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.